Yes, sir. Thank you. Right, we are looking at the life and times of Alexander Pope, and the way in which his life and times affected his writing. The Pope was born in 1688 uh, in London, but uh, Pope's family was a practicing Roman Catholic family, and therefore uh, they were largely excluded from any high office in court. Now, this provoked a certain degree of uh, resentment in the family and would later on also lead to uh, a, a popes being excluded from court. And therefore, he took up uh, a residence, the family took up residence largely across the River Thames. Uh, uh, Pope would ultimately come to Twickenham and therefore uh, form a club with the other Catholic poets and uh, Tory writers of the period. Now, uh, Pope's father was a linen draper, so he belonged largely to a merchant family. And uh, he came to live in a place called Windsor Forest. Now, Windsor Forest will later on become the locus of uh, one of Pope's very famous pastoral poems. Now, it's very interesting that Pope in his childhood suffered from a disease called Pott's disease, which largely stunted his growth. And therefore, Pope suffered from, you know, deformity. He was just approximately four feet tall and uh, bad health throughout. In fact, in one of his poems, he wrote about this long curse, my life. Right. Therefore, uh, poor health stunted growth. Uh, blighted him throughout his living career. Now, on the one hand, because he was a Catholic, he was largely excluded from the public schools in England at that point of time. But Pope was largely educated at home. And he was a prodigy in the sense that he could pick up the classical languages. And he read the classics very thoroughly. Uh, he, therefore, uh, had a quite an irregular education in that sense of the term, reading largely due to his own pleasure, and learned French and Latin uh, from home schooling. Uh, he read the translations of the Greek, Latin, and Italian poets. So by the age of 12, when he was finally settled, he had already chosen poetry as a career and was extremely well versed in classical literature. Now, the classical model of writing, especially that of satire, would be his chosen destination in literature, his chosen goal in literature. And these would be largely the models on whom he would base his entire career. Now, uh, he then started to look for patronage at this point of time, which was essential for any young poet to break through. And you can see that you had William Trumbull, uh, retired dip diplomat, uh, Thomas Dang Doncastle, and he moved from patron to patron. And through them, he made a friendship with the noted restoration comic writer, uh, Wycherley. Now, Wycherley's letters to Pope were very interesting in the sense that he acknowledged that Pope was a prodigy and that his poetry and his uh, verses had immense potential. Now, through at this point of time, he also comes in contact with a publisher called William Walsh. And Walsh talks about, and Walsh advised Pope about correctness in his satires. And Pope would later on acknowledge Walsh's contribution. And uh, many of the ideas of the essay on criticism would be taken actually from the advice of William Walsh. Now, he had therefore chosen, as I point out, poetry as his only business and idleness as his only pleasure. Now, therefore, 
His first publication comes in the classical mode of the pastorals uh, and is published in Lintet's, uh, Thompson's Poetical Miscellanies. I'm sorry. Uh, this is sometime uh, around 1709 that Pope's first pastoral poems are published in an anthology which con comprised of poems from Ambrose, Phillips, Sheffield, Garth, and Rowe, who were some of the noted periods, uh, noted poets of this period. Therefore, what I'm trying to suggest is that at a very early age, Pope is breaking in, being recognized as a prodigious classical writer uh, who writes in imitation of the classical masters and therefore breaks through into the literary scene. Now, the next major publication which really made Pope's mark was Essay on Criticism. And we had a lovely presentation on the essay on criticism earlier. So you have seen how essay on criticism actually took many of the fundamental ideas from Horace's Ars Poetica, a manual of poetry writing, as it were, and used the structure of the epigram and the heroic couplet to formulate certain ideas. What should be good poetry. Pope would suggest that good poetry would combine education and pleasure. Who would be a good critic? A good critic, poet would suggest, would be uh, unbiased. Who would be a good poet? A good poet, Pope would suggest, would write carefully, continuously amend, amend his poems, change his poems, and keep his peace with him so that he tried to attain perfection in poetry. So once again, essay on criticism becomes kind of a poetic manifesto here, talking about the kind of poetry that Pope would write, like to write, and also the ideas, the fundamental ideas of classical uh, criticism and the idea of poetry that he would nurture throughout his, uh, his career. Now, uh, his aim was, as I point out, to condense, methodize, and give us perfect and novel expression about the poem's aims and method. Right. Now, therefore, this is, I would say, the first phase of his career, which approximately comes to a close in 1711 with the uh, publication of the essay on criticism. Now, this phase is marked by his grooming in classical literature, his expression in classical forms, and his formulation of the idea of satire, poetry, poet, and the critic. Right. Now, 1712, I think, marks a transition when Pope starts to write The Rape of the Lock the poem that we will study. Now, it is important for you to understand how this poem came to be written. Now, as you are aware that Catholics were not allowed high offices and they were often shunned from court. Therefore, they often formed a kind of a closed community. Now, within this closed community, there occurred a major scandal sometime around late 1711 and 1712 in the sense that a nobleman called Lord Peter, a nobleman called Lord Peter, P-E-T-R-E, mind you, cut off the lock of hair of a young woman, aristocratic woman of the former family. F-E-R-M-O-R. -E the woman's name, or the young lady's name, was Arabella Farmer, and uh, she was part of this Catholic fraternity, and this was done purely in jest in a party that was organized. Therefore, this created a lot of social tension among the Catholic families. That is to say that the Catholic families 
started almost a feud amongst themselves and gradually the other Catholic families also got involved so much so that the society at this point of time within the Catholic community was split down the middle. The Pope's friend, Carroll, John Carroll, who was also part of this fraternity, therefore asked him to write a poem that would laugh this quarrel out. So dissolve this quarrel into a laughter. Uh, Pope proceeded, therefore, to write a poem on the cutting off of a lock of hair. This would be the source or the history of the writing of the rape of the lock. Right. So a family feud which threatened to split the Catholic community right down the middle. And this became the source of the writing of the rape of the lock. Right. So you have it. And it is published in three cantos in Lintet's miscellanies. Uh, and you can see that William, the fourth Baron Peter, had surreptitiously cut off a lock of Arabella Farmer's hair. And it had created a breach between the families. Now, the models that Pope was using here was the mock heroic poetry of the French tradition, especially the French poet Beaulieu and his poem called La Lutrine. You can see the spelling there, La Lutrine, L -E -L -E -L -U -T -R -I -N, L-U-T-R-I-N, La Lutrine, where Beaulieu had used a similar mock heroic motive. And he had also used uh, the supernatural machinery, so uh, unnatural, supernatural beings as part of the poem. You remember your, in your epic, the gods would fight with the men, so the epic used a supernatural machinery. Similarly, Pope uses the supernatural machinery of tiny supernatural creatures called sylphs. Right. So he was borrowing from the French tradition. He was using the classical tradition of the mock uh, of the epic poetry and transforming it into the mock epic in the way that Dryden had done. And it is important to understand that Pope was taking this tradition of Dryden's mock epic and trying to sophisticate it. Now, interestingly, what happens in this poem is that Pope does not attack any particular uh, woman or event very drastically as did uh, Dryden in uh, Matt Fleckner. What he does is generate a comic satire with great laughter and tries to feminize the world of the epic. This is to say, the world of the epic, if you've already noticed, is based on the ethics of valor, masculinity, bravery, combat, bloodshed, right? Therefore, heroic battle is and is the world or the formative world of the epic. And therefore, what you have actually is a tremendously masculine world. The epic is a very masculine genre in that sense of the term. What Pope does is transfer the entire mock heroic energy into the creation of the world of the young woman. And thereby he feminizes it completely. So this art of replacement, therefore, becomes an art of replacement of the masculine epic with the feminine world of Belinda. And in doing so, the target of satire becomes female vanity. Of course, Pope is also satirizing the uh, what you can call the idleness of the aristocratic way of life. The fact that, you know, such a social brawl could become uh, possible through such a trivial event is, is, is criticizing the aristocratic uh, idleness and lack of activity. 
but the primary source of satire is the world of the vain woman and her fascination with herself with her own beauty right and therefore through this both satire becomes a broader satire on the category of the woman a womanliness as it were now you will of course remember that at this point of time there were certain debates that were coming up about whether women should be educated or what was the role of the woman in the new society that was emerging in fact there was this entire consideration about marriage earlier marriage was almost a feudal institution when the word husband meant us bonda my lord the lord of the family right the lord of the house us was the law uh, house and bonda was the lord so us bonda would mean the lord of the house you could see how feudal that word was now around the turn of the century there was this idea of the companionate marriage with the woman would not be inferior but would be the companion of the man right so ideas about women were changing there was a lot of women writers who were coming up and therefore in a, in a certain way uh, the very structure of society which looked at the woman the way in which society looked at the woman was undergoing a certain transition and it is here therefore that pope's rape of the law becomes an important document in considering how or framing the responses towards feminine vanity and pride right so this was the history of the writing of the rape of the lock uh so pope was now experimenting with the idea of the mock epic he was trying to uh, carve out a niche for himself now winsor forest uh came next and this uh was uh based on uh the pastoral tradition and was published in 1713 so you can see pope was already uh established as a poet uh, as a poet at this point in time and pope was steering away i would say towards from the uh, uh tradition of uh of story satire uh, from the tradition of Uh, aligning with a political party so he was politically neutral as it were at the same time pope was by now part and parcel of uh, the entire society of the period uh, the literary society so his friends included the major, all the major poets so he was by now firmly entrenched into uh, contemporary literary society now next in line comes pope's classical eva and this is where pope started to translate homer and this took him almost approximately 12 years but by this time he was writing also uh, certain personal poems including his elegy on an un unfortunate lady uh, eloisia to abelard a selection of poems based on love and uh his translations on of homer so uh by 1720 pope's translation of homer is almost complete and he is holding them up for subscription gathering significant amount of money and uh pope earned as you can see from the figure almost 8000 in in revenue and therefore was one of the more established uh, poets who was independent due to his literary activities but now in 1725 pope uh had made a considerable sum by uh, his edition of shakespeare and this edition of shakespeare provoked a significant amount of criticism and you remember the shakespeare publishing shakespeare and with uh, 
an annotated edition was becoming quite a literary activity during this period. And therefore, Pope's edition was attacked by his rival poets, including Theobald. And this was the occasion for the writing of the Dunciad. So Pope, by this time, is translating Homer, is publishing uh, the edition of Shakespeare, and his friendship with poets, his enmity with the poetic circle was also growing. Who were his friends? His friends were primarily the Tory satirists, including the dramatist John Gay, Jonathan Swift. Therefore, this was part of a club of satirists that had assembled, and they called themselves the Scrib Lerus Club. The Scrib Lerus Club. Right. So this was a club of satirists who shared their writings and were primarily Tory in their political inclination. Uh, on the other hand, Pope had his detractors, including Colly Sibber, Theobald. He had had a brush with uh, the preeminent critic of the period, Addison, and had satirized him as Atticus in one of his poems. So Pope was a rather abrasive, almost uh, uh, a person who, who engaged in a lot of confrontation, both in his personal as well as in his poetic life. And wherever he had a, had a confrontation, he tried to satirize through his poetry. Right. By this time, Pope is, of course, financially independent, quite rich, in fact, and has moved to Twickenham, has built his own house, which had a grotto at a kind of a sort of uh, classical grotto where he would retire uh, to write his poetry and reflect. And he was uh, in great friendship with Dr. John Arbuthnot, the King's physician, John Gay, Bolingbroke, and Swift. These were part of the Scribblerus Club, as I had pointed out. Pope, by this time, was coming in close contact with the Blount sisters, of which the Blount sisters, they were named Teresa Blount and uh, Mary Martha Blount. Now, Pope was quite close with Martha. And after 1717, he exchanged a series of letters. And both of them, uh, despite the hint of a scandal, spent a considerable amount of time together. Now, from 1725 onwards, so this period, 1712 to 1725, I would say is the second part of Pope's literary career, where he's experimenting with the mock heroic in The Rape of the Lock. He is translating Homer, he's publishing his edition of Shakespeare. And therefore, the majority of his translational work, classical work, comes during this period. Post-1725 comes two major works, the first being the Essay on Man and the second being the Dunciad. Right. Now, and this is also the time we will remember, 1725-26, is when some of the most important satires of the period come out. Jonathan Swift publishes Gulliver's Travels approximately around 1725-26. John Gay publishes a satirical play, The Beggar's Opera, around this time. And Pope publishes The Dunciad. Right. So together, I, I am suggesting that all these, all these authors, dramatists, poets, were engaged in an atmosphere of collaborative ideas of satire where the predominant follies, the corruption of the period, could be attacked. Now, Swift's satire in Gulliver's Travels is largely about man and his corruption and the innate nature of man. Gay is attacking the corrupt administration of the Prime Minister Walpole. And Pope is attacking the atmosphere of folly of the period. Right. Therefore, 
three different satires, but approximately during the same interval. Right. So uh, you can see that you know the Scribblerus Club, which is indicated here, uh, resumed their own own amusement of parodying and ridiculing bad letters. Right. So this comes seven. Therefore, comes Dunciard in seventeen twenty eight. Uh, based on the treatise of the bathos or the art of sinking in poetry. Once again, we had another fabulous presentation on the Danshiad where you could see how, you know, darkness, uh, ignorance, dullness becomes the leading uh, target of Pope's poem. But again, within this broader satire on dullness, Pope also significantly criticizes uh, his rival poets, especially Theobald, who becomes uh, the target in the first edition of Danciad, and later on would be another minor poet, Colley Sibber. Now, who becomes the object of the target of the satire? It was Theobald, Colley Sibber, John Dennis, Richard Bentley, Aaron Hill, Bernard Lintot. Lintot, in fact, had been his publisher earlier, but even he was not spared. So the entire gamut of poets, publishers, who were part of his rival circle or who had come into conflict with Pope, now are targeted in Pope's uh, uh, in Pope's poem in Danshia. Now, the Danshia, because it was so personal and scurrilous, was published anonymously, and uh, it also indulged in a significant amount of political satire against the Prime Minister Robert Walpole. Now, Walpole had been a subject of satire for a lot of poets during this period because of his corrupt administration and because he was seen as a kind of a, of a presiding Prime Minister who fostered this cult of greed ambition and corruption. With this, Pope added this concept of dullness, stupidity, and therefore Walpole becomes a figure, a target in these poems of an endemic state of corrupt humanity. Now, 1733 marks the publication of uh, Pope's essay on man. Uh, once again, now Pope is moving away from personal satire to a general satire on mankind, right? And uh, this is a different order of poetry altogether. The Pope was uh, almost in the way of the deist philosophy, D-E-I-S-T, which believed that everything that happened, happened as per God's plan. And therefore, Pope tries to explain the human universe as part of a greater plan of God. Now, he had planned several other parts of Essay on Man as well. One part would talk about the human reason, for example, and uh, the other part would talk about human society. But uh, Essay on Man remains one of the most profound within philosophical aspect parts of that period, parts of the period, and uh, he is therefore uh, talking in terms of a didacticism and epigrams, which uh, are which are largely professing ideas on human nature. So you have the use of riches, you have the epilogue to the satires, you have the moral essays and imitations of Horace. These were published as letters to different poets and figures, for example, the letter to Arbuthnot and so on and so forth, uh, epistle rather. 1744, Pope, after a prolonged bout of illness, passes away and is buried in the parish church of Twickenham. Now remember that Pope was also great friends with uh, Sir Isaac Newton. In fact, if you remember your Dan Brown, you'll remember that Pope 
was uh, Pope presided over the funeral of uh, Sir Isaac Newton. So in Pope, what we have actually is a combination of scientific ideas, of ideas of how society should behave, what of moderation of the poet and the satirist, the idea of perfection of poetry, and in general, of the improvement of society. Therefore, this is the context, the broader context of the satires. Pope was writing in a period where writing of satire was intimately concerned with the criticism of corruption of the period, a rigorous examination of human nature, human philosophy was undertaken, and poetry was largely thought to be based on the classical norms of writing poetry. So it was a prescriptive art of writing poetry rather than being original. So originality was, as it were, not a virtue as it was during the Romantic period. Formal structures were to be re respected. And within that, you know, a critical look at society was to be undertaken. Very often, this critical look at society dissolved into the personal bias of the poet. And therefore, the satire could often be extremely personal. Pope's career therefore shows his initial estrangement from society, his casting off from society, his diseased uh, life. We then look at his classical self-training, his experimentation with classical forms, and his attempt at writing you know, poems which would be critical of poor poetic taste and would examine human nature in details. Now, we'll have to understand that part of Pope's venom in the satire comes from the attacks that he had to face. There's also this uh, fascination within Pope with his own status as a rake. So he wanted to pose as a person who was very romantic. But he was repeatedly spurned by women, mocked for his short stature, in fact, attacked very viciously. And therefore, Pope was rather misogynistic in some of his poems. In fact, there are lines like, every woman at heart is a rake. It's so it's suggested that every woman is unfaithful in the end. So the there is a certain degree of misogyny operating within Pope. There is a lot of venom, personal attack, which probably derived from uh, the attacks which were made against his personality. So Pope's life was a strange contradiction. On the one hand, philosophical examination of human nature, a broad view of mankind in general, almost philosophical, prescriptive. And on the other hand, Pope could equally be nasty and vigorous and venomous in his satire, person. So it is this combination, strangely, of the Horatian, Juvenalian elements together with personal satire and lampoon that mark his literary career. As you can observe, the, the entire trajectory from Pope's, uh, uh, from Pope's, uh, from Dryden to Pope is quite clear in the way that the mock heroic is used, that the heroic couplet is perfected, and the aims of satire from general satire to personal satire, from examination of human nature to the world of uh, personal invective is used. It is in this sense that you see Pope's world is being built up. He was not very, he was not very intimate with the court in any sense of the term. And there was a kind of a distant critical view that he took of political powers. But his 
main thrust in the satires is the craft of writing and the art of uh, art of good poetry that becomes and the literary universe becomes the thrust of his poems that then is the world of alexander pope and a brief idea of his life i just like to hasten to add that the selection that i've taken is from the encyclopedia britannica and therefore uh, you know gives us a fair idea of the ways in which his poetic trajectory took off uh, it is with that therefore that we come to the conclusion of this class having given you an idea of the world of pope in our next class what we shall take up is the dedicatory epistle and we shall once again reiterate what made pope write the rape of the lock and how uh, the first canto would progress right it is with that therefore that i am stopping the recording now